All right, good morning. Um, I, I noticed few um, reviews for this paper, so um, keep up with the reviews on the online system, right? Um, so you got the homework assignment, right? The homework assignment was online. Um, and I hope the projects are coming along fine and everything. <coughs> are there any questions with what you, what you covered so far? Huh? Um, yeah, some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so are there any questions about what we covered so far? We kind of moving in the file system towards sort of the distributed system, right? I think I think this set of chain of papers sort of build on each other. So um, we kind of adding some of the, the challenges with, with file systems, right? Um, and one of the things, some of the comments, I think one of the common com reviewers said um, that with the respect to RAID, that the modern RAIDs are, um, I mean, these people didn't, haven't heard the full modern versions of RAID, I believe, right? Um, but I think the RAID paper came right about this time, maybe a little uh, earlier, or, or, I mean, it came from the same school, right? So they, they must have talked before then. The notions of RAID that we use were already in the first paper, right? All the RAID uh, up to five were there in the paper. RAID six was added later, but RAID six is not particularly that different. I mean, that's two different kinds of parity algorithms. And so RAID five and RAID six is, you know, that's two different parity algorithms. And that's possible when you have more computational facilities. So the original paper didn't talk about that, but that's, I don't, I don't consider that to be like a, that big a difference, right? So when this paper came out, RAID was out and all the concepts that you know right now about RAID was there. The hardware was not there, there was no RAID, RAID, RAID controllers or whatever to take the load. So it was done in software um, and so that's, that's that, right? Um, so, I mean, if there is some notions in RAID that they should have used, they should have used it. I mean, there's a valid critique for their work because they should have known about it, they should have done that, right? Now, and the other concern was the, the it may be better to assume like more, more, more uh, servers, more storage servers, and um, deal with that in, a, in the you know like assume larger storage, large more servers and stuff, which may not have been true when they were writing this paper, right? I think the hard disk they used was like one gigabyte or something, so they were not. I mean, it, it had more disk than whatever before, but not what we're used to right now, right? And, and probably they didn't have as many as many desktops as we have right now. But they did work on something like of that nature in like mid 90s and late 90s and stuff. So this is you know, part of ongoing stuff. So um, in some sense, you, you want to see how it will fit into our modern world, but they may, may not have lived in that concept. I mean, the idea of a lot of memory would be, they use 32 megabytes for their desktops, right? So they would have been very happy if it was more than that, right? Their memory was not big enough to store all the things that they should have been able to store to get good performance out of the system, right? So that, that said, um, what do you guys think of this paper? Sort of extension of log structured file system, sort of adding RAID, and sort of distributed systems, distributed file systems, which many of you pointed out, is not fully flushed out here. It's not you know, it, it's not, I mean, there are issues with it as a distributed file system, right? Especially the consistency semantics are not that well flushed out. And we'll see in the, in the, in, in future lectures, um, the issue of consistency and how the, they didn't, they, they didn't go too much detail of those, right? Other than that, how was this, what was your opinion of the paper? Does anyone want to summarize what this, what the, what's important about this paper? Well, what did you find important about interesting about this paper? Monica? Yeah. So, like, uh, I found uh, they use the two approaches mm -hmm. uh, effectively the log structured approach and the RAID, which mm -hmm. is new with respect to that. So, what do you think the log structured? approach is, uh, it's appropriate, right? Right, I mean, uh, it's efficient when you have a uh, batch of updates or like greater rise, that would uh, effectively, you can 
same day we did batch. Mm-hmm. For the file manager. Some of, many of you had concerns about the file manager, right? So what are the what is the concerns? What what are the concerns that you had? Uh, well, in the paper they say uh, in order to eliminate performance bottlenecks, multiple paths must exist between the source and the sync of data and the disk, so that different paths can be used to reach uh, different disks. And it seems that the, the file manager kind of doesn't hold to that because it's a single point of mm -hmm. entry to the entire file system. So it. I don't understand why they would say something like that, but then not try or not give away or really say that their approach to, to using a single point as an entryway was adequate, mm -hmm. even though they had that. Yeah. So, so all the process of metadata is on the file, on the master mm -hmm. manager, and that implies that if you lose that machine, then all of your director names, your iNode, all that, all those numbers are gone. Mm -hmm. So you have no file system. So um, one argument is this is not exact. I mean, this is not really designed as a network file system. I mean, they, they, they do go there. I mean, because the nature of what they do, but they're not. They're not. I mean, they, they didn't take the full jump there, right? I mean, they, they didn't talk about what's the consistency of if you have multiple clients updating stuff on different uh, clients. The consistency is what it is. I mean, it's not like flushed out as we'll see in some of the the, the future papers, right? So who wants to defend their, their notion of having a single file server? I, file, I mean, they have one single file server, right? And how easy would it be to fix the problem? Um, or is that, is, that, is that such a big deal? Yeah. Well, they talk about the, po I mean, they didn't implement it, but they talk about the possibility of maybe having the file manager sort of distributed across the clients mm -hmm. or in, and like keeping all that information in memory mm -hmm. and doing some sort of protocol to keep them consistent mm -hmm. but then not having to worry about it, about having that single point of failure, mm -hmm. that single performance bottleneck anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, I mean, you know, anything can be, if you can distribute the storage, you can distribute the file manager, right? And so that's sort of the argument you could have, right? Um, would that be an easy task in this world? So if you look at, you know, for a file system, you need the, to store the data and you need to store the metadata, right? And what they've done is they distributed the, the data, data storage, but they didn't distribute the metadata storage, right? How would you distribute the metadata among multiple servers? Yeah. I think they mentioned that if you have um, more than one file hmm. server and you distribute the metadata, then it, it effectively becomes a distribution. Mm -hmm. And in that case, all the different protocols of cache currency and all those stuff comes in. Mm -hmm. So it would be totally different. What do you mean it could be totally different? I mean, the algorithms for maintaining the consistency of the data would have to be implemented. Okay. As in, like, traditional distributed systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. The easiest way to break it up would probably be to break up the tree structure and make each also mm -hmm. responsible for a section of the tree. Mm -hmm. because otherwise, you have to deal with serious consistency problems. Yeah, so, so one of the ways you can distribute that is, so one of the ways you can distribute it is, you know, have the same, like the file system namespace tree on multiple servers, right? And run consistency protocols to make sure that the, 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 the things, so instead of one file manager, if you have 10 file managers, you can make sure that all 10 file managers know the exact same tree exact same namespace. So anybody can go to any file server and any file manager and they'll know exactly what you want to do, right? The other approach is to naturally kind of split it up. So you can say your home directory will be on that server, that, you know, everybody else's home directory will be on, on a different server, right? And so that way they don't have to talk to each other. Each server is responsible for its own chunk of the namespace, right? So hopefully as long as, long as like one of you doesn't have much more files than the rest of you, you can sort of um, do, do load balance at that level, right? Which is sort of what AFS tends to do, right? AFS, not just for namespace, but it, it classes it as uh, cell servers. So you can move these things around. So essentially you, you have the responsibility, we'll see that in a in, uh, in, in couple of lectures, but essentially you want to move the, you can load balance it at the, at the notion of applications, right? Um, so, 
in, in any system that's, I mean, any distributed system, that's, that, that's always going to be some bottleneck, right? I mean, so if you want to get rid of all the bottleneck, you will have to distribute everything, right? And if you distribute everything, we look at this concept in, in, a, in a vague fashion before, you have to figure out what the failure model is, right? So if you talk about Vicentine Falls, then it creates a n number of replicas, and um, I'm sure you, it, you remember those those things from earlier in the semester, right? So if you have a certain number of Byzantine faults, you need to have maintain a certain number of replicas and you need to maintain the state among those, which is essentially what you have to do here. And it, it you may or may not want to do all the all the all the stuff, right? So so you know, so people like the notion of like being able to stripe it across across this. And um, and the, the file the file manager is a, is a bottleneck, right? So what about the clients being able to do this stuff? We didn't read the other paper. There's, there are other work which looked at all this distribution happening at the server, right? So in, in this model, the, the clients are the ones which decide to stripe the data, right? The, the, the file manager holds the metadata of where things are, but the client decides what sort of manager it has to do and, and sends the data. The server does not make any decision on where things should go, right? So there's no global optimization. So if the clients decide that they want to send to server one, two, one, three, and all of them decide to send it to one, two, one, three, right? The server is not actively involved in telling where things should go, right? What do you think of that notion that the, the clients, so the clients only look at what files they operate on, right? They don't coordinate with anybody else. So if you, if you and somebody else are operating on the same file, whatever updates that you do are logged into your stuff, whatever updates somebody else does, is logged onto the stuff, onto the uh, storage. The file manager is involved with, with with maintaining some consistency, but the decision is entirely client-centric, right? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that something that you found interesting or? Um, That's one of the main contributions of their work, which is they they look at it from the client perspective, right? Even shared files are operated independently on the different clients, and the resolution of what stays is done elsewhere, but they get to decide to store the files, right? Is that a good thing? Seems like they could really mess up the entire system if they uh, to, if they force writes like uh, all the time or something like that. Mm -hmm. So if there are malicious machines attached to the system, it'd be post. That's an excellent point, though they don't deal with that at all, right? So the 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 question of security, right? Security and the whole shebang, right? They don't touch it at all, right? Is that something they should have touched? So essentially, right now, anybody can store to the storage servers, right? Um, and they didn't, they didn't say who, how, you, how the storage node knows who is writing to it. But for all practical purposes, I think anybody can talk to the storage node and store something, right? Um, is that a bad thing? What's, what's, so what's the good thing about having the clients do that rather than server, right? We didn't read the paper, but, but the essential idea here would be if I want to write something, I send it to the server which decides where things should go, or I ask the server, um, either, either I send the data to the server and the server distributes them, or I ask the server, the server tells you that, okay, you need to send these files to some, some you know, certain number of nodes, right? So either I send a message to the server for all the data are just for the metadata of where things should go, right? Yeah. That puts extra load on the network because you have to send it, because the client has to send it to the server and then the server has to send it out again to other servers. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it reduces the time <coughs> needed to perform operations if you can manage it yourself without querying the server every time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the micro kernel, exo kernel argument versus the monolithic kernel. Do you want the user space to have the control over mm -hmm. where the files get stored, or do you want mm -hmm. the uh, kernel space? And whereas the kernel space in this case would be file manager and the user space would be the client. Uh, 
and that's it's basically that kind of argument all over again, just an A file system type approach. But what about the security notion, right? What what about like trust and um, you can mitigate that if you use proper encryption protocols and, and a proper protocol to talk to the uh, so you can't you can't you obviously can never prevent it completely, but you can mitigate it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure um, you could also mitigate it by where you accept requests from and how you accept requests, and as long as the, the the session is like authenticated. It's like you could just basically open an SSL connection with any all the servers mm -hmm. and only allow it with certain authenticated hosts. So you can mitigate it. You obviously can't prevent it. But that's going to be a problem in any kind of distributed file system where the files aren't stored on the hard disk. Even if the files aren't stored on the hard disk, a malicious user can just go in and write whatever they want to. So, 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 you, so you're bringing large, many issues, right? So um, we haven't talked about security, right? I mean, we'll look, touch a little bit on security at, at the end, but let's assume that uh, security is a problem, right? So one of the ways to, you can mitigate security is have some kind of encryption, have some kind of uh, algorithms to make sure that only secure communication happen. And you also have to have a notion of authorization, right? Which is sort of what you're what you're talking about, right? So I need to know that I can store it to the uh, the particular storage, and storage has to know who I am, and it has to know whether it can. So it has to have some policies to know whether I can be done, right? So if you do a full blown case, that means I need to kind of tell you who I am. And you need to kind of verify, right? Because you may not know who I am, so you have to ask somebody to verify uh, who I really am, and then let me do the stuff, right? You can, it's, it's sort of like what, you, what we do in real life, right? So if you walk over, I, every time I can, I can ask for your ID or something, and then I can verify your ID with, with some authority to make sure that you are valid, or I can generally trust you because, um, I mean, you all look like students, so I'm, I'm assuming that you are students, and I'm gonna go with that, right? And I think they, this this work kind of goes in that model, right? I mean, it, I think simple stuff is, you know, if, if it comes to the local area network, I kind of assume that they are, you are all part of the system kind of stuff, right? Um, the the challenge is, if you want to do it more harder, if you want to make it really secure, and it's sort of the SSL and, and stuff you mentioned. So you're solving one problem of what happens when the data is going on the wire, right? So that SSL helps. You know, if you encrypt the data on the wire, so whatever I send to the storage server is the one that gets stored, right? The issue of authorization and authentication, you have to figure out how much you want, right? If you really want it to be completely authenticated, every pack, every packet to be fully checked and stuff, then you are having to call the server to verify something, right? So I'm not sure how well, if you add both of those, right? So if I, I can send it to the server, server tells me, gives me some credential that I can give it to you to make it go. The number of messages that you send for a server-based system versus a client-based system where I decide who I should store, but you, on the other hand, the storage itself turns around and asks somebody whether I should be trusted, right? Does that make sense? So here is a, cli a client, right? And here is your file manager, and here is your, let's say, storage server, right? So in the server-based system, I, I may have to ask the server for something. It may, it, it may come back and say, you can store on this storage server and this storage server. Here are some credentials that you can use, so securely you can store, right? So I get this, this message back. Then I send the data to, to these uh, storage servers, right? On the other hand, if I send it directly with the approach that they use, where I send a, um, my data to these storage servers, and I also send something here so it knows what I stored, right? If it has to trust me by asking uh, authentication server, whether I can be trusted, and it, it comes back for every single message, every single things I do, right? So if you look at the overall network uh, number of packets, right? Number of messages, number of whatever overhead you look, it may or may not work out to your advantage, right? So some of these systems make assumptions. Some of these things don't really care about security because adding security, adding and making it secure means that you're pushing the cost from here. You made this simple by trusting anybody to send the data here, but then you're making it complicated by having to verify who where it's coming from, right? Moving forward right now, would this be a this would have been a more of a concern back when this were one gigabyte, right? When this are a lot bigger, would that be less of a concern or more of a concern? Meaning if you build the storage servers, 
Um, so it looks like if you want to implement a zebra, right? The storage servers are very, very simple, very easy to implement, right? So the, the set of operations it supports are very small, and you ought to be able to write your zebra storage server in a week or so, because it doesn't practically do anything. It, it, you, know, you basically give it a segment and it stores it, right? And if you ask it, it'll give it to you. It doesn't do any authentication or whatever, right? So if you keep it that simple, that any, anybody can store anything to you, would that be of a, as much of a concern as it should have been back then as it is right now, given the fact that disks are a lot bigger? Yeah? I think the bigger problem isn't necessarily being able to store things, although that's a problem, but actually being able to read things. OK, so, so there are two problems, right? One is who can store and who can read the stuff, right? So how would you solve the, the second problem of who, who can read? Can you solve it by encrypting, right? We, we haven't looked at what encryption is, but essentially you make it such that only the intended author can read the stuff. So if when I, it's my job that when I still store something, I do something so that nobody else can read it, right? Arguably. I mean, you have to assume that there is sufficiently powerful encryption mechanisms to do that, right? Um, I mean, the, everything is a trade-off, right? Obviously, here it depends on how much you care about the data, right? So obviously, if I'm storing something super important, I will have to run the proper encryption algorithms, right? Um, so my question is, going forward, is this that big a deal as it should have been back then, right? They didn't touch it. I mean, they didn't mention that as a problem at all, right? I mean, actually, that's a, that's a good point. Um, they didn't mention anywhere that there's an issue of security or what, whatever, right? I mean, it, it's, it's you decide, you know who to send and you send it. There's no notion of this quota or anything, right? I as a client can create as much as I want because there is no control path which tell, that's the source server tell me that back off or whatever, right? There's no notion of fairness. One client can use as much as it wants and all those are ignored, right? Um, and that's that's a very excellent excellent point, and I think that's one of the things that would um, would would make e one of these things possible or not possible, right? And I think the modern systems are are um, are evolving in certain directions where the answers to that would would you know, you'll have some answers to what what it means to do right now, right? Um, yeah. There, I think it's a relatively solved problem in terms of how you would go about this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, if you just use some kind of Kerberos technique, you could have an authentication server where you authenticate to, and then uh, basically as you have drawn, but as opposed to having to authenticate mm -hmm. for every packet that you send, you just have to authenticate every time you want to start a connection. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you have a connection, you can use it until you close it. So basically when a user logs in, he authenticates with the server, he can then authenticate with each of the storage clients, and then continues normally. So it's a, it's a slight overhead, but it's an overhead at startup. And no, the way Kerberos works is it has tokens, right? You go to the authentication server, and authentication server gives you a token that you that acts as your credential, right? Then I can go to the client, then you, I can go to the storage server and say, uh, trust me because I have this token from the server, right? The, 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 storage, the storage servers can verify the validity of the token without having to go back to the server. So it doesn't have to know who you are. All it knows is whoever has this token has to be trusted, right? So if I can somehow give my token to you, then you would you would have all the privileges that I have. So somebody, somehow you have to make sure that I don't give my tokens to the wrong person, but I can give it to the right person. So I, I, you know, I want to help him, so I can give him my token. I don't want to help you, so I don't want to give you a token. So that's, somehow we have to do that. So once we do that, we have to have a notion of expression because otherwise, whatever I gave him, he'll have to have it forever, right? So you have a notion of tokens and expression. And again, depending on what the intervals are, right? So if you get a token which expires in a week, then basically he can be me for a week. If I give it for five minutes, then we have to get a new token, send it to him, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? right. But so I, I think the overhead isn't too, too bad if you set it to something reasonable like I mean, if, if, it's, if it's in a company type setting, then eight hours seems reasonable because that's how long you're going to be there for a day. So it's basically a day long. And if, you, if they happen to be there longer than eight hours or, you know, whatever, then they re and it's fine. But I, I just don't think that it's that much overhead, uh, especially with today's computers. 
and the fact that the storage servers are going to be incredibly simple, and they'll probably have way too much processing power for what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. So, but that's my... No, 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 no. So I, 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 think, I think the bottom line, what you're saying is, there's a whole slew of data set you have to consider, right? So depending on how important the data is and, and all the stuff, you know, you, you said that expiration times are um, what have you. So you can play with, with these stuff, right? So, so in the simple case, everything has to do all the stuff. And essentially, all this is caching, right? You're caching the, you don't have to go to the server. So you can cache something, you can, you can play those games. And depending on how important things are, you find a sweet spot where it's acceptable to you, right? And, and that's, 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 the, that's, that's, that's the point, right? Um, does it, does it, so the, there is no one answer. It depends on what, what you're trying to do, right? Um, so I, I, um, I, I don't know much of how the, the grid community is moving forward with this stuff, and I had to ask him again. So this seems like the, the file system model that you would want for gridish kind of stuff, right? You have lots of uh, dust stuff, what have you, and trying to build a file system on top of it, right? So what's the general thinking along those lines? And what does DR, CRC support something like that? model, like a Zebra-like file system, client-based um, storage server, you directly send, you know, send this stuff, right? Any of you? Huh? I don't think CRC supports. Okay. Like what, do you, what is your... I don't know about CRC, but uh, uh, we have a channel file system, which is a file system, mm -hmm. and uh, it's pretty much similar to this. We have like a Catalog servers, mm -hmm. uh, which you know the storage server just advertised mm -hmm. you know their resource, which is the hard drive, how many it's value, value. Mm -hmm. and then you know the the, the the client like talk to the catalog server and then find out where is the value you can write to, and then just write to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but this is this is the direction that you would want to go, right? I mean, in, in terms of you know, as the desktops and storage becomes um, bigger and more cap more more capacity, this is this is like a interesting venue to go forward, right? Um, I haven't seen any work on. So one of the one of the research things that we wanted to look at, and we haven't looked at it in some senses. Ignore the, author, the security at all fully, right? And, and let anybody store anything that they want because the storage is big enough and the network is fast enough, right? See how far you can take those, right? Uh, they, then you still run into other issues, right? So I can do a denial of service attack by just storing stuff on you. Your network may be fast enough, but you may die from other things, right? Um, but anyway, so, that, so, um, so that's one of, the, one of the, the things that they added, yeah. Actually, so couldn't you... Uh mitigate a lot of that by just controlling access to the file manager? Which because one? let's say Which somebody one? wanted to store something on a storage server, right? Mm -hmm. You let them do it. Mm -hmm. But you don't index it in the file manager. Mm -hmm. Then when somebody looks at an index of the servers, mm -hmm. they're not going to see that the storage server has that spot used. Because you mean the, the, the one that... Manager. So are you talking about the thing I said of as research or...? Yeah. Okay. So, well, I, just the entire concept of keeping the storage servers as really, really dumb and st storing whatever you tell it to store. Oh, so, but, so, then, but so, then having the file manager say, well, these areas should be open on the storage servers, so you, anybody can just overwrite them. Yeah, so I, I, I don't want to get into the research aspect of it, but our, our goal there is nothing is there, right? There's no file manager or anything, right? Anybody can store anything. It's up to you to manage everything, right? Um, it's more like a peer-to-peer -peer file than file system-like stuff, right? So how does a client know? We can take it offline because that's that's beyond the scope of what we're doing in this class, right? Um, no, those are inter there's a lot of interesting stuff, but um, one of my goals is I don't want to like look into the absolute newest kind of technologies because I think it's kind of beyond the scope of what you want to achieve in this class, right? We want to give an introduction on the, how the, um, what is the important techniques in, in operating systems. Um, and in sort of, so some of these things are old, but they're still quite relevant. It still feels like we could be running this on our desktops right now. Um, and that's sort of unfortunate, right? So the, the LFS sounds like, it should have been there right now. You know, there's there's no reason why it should have sort of 
died after that even though it was considered to be a very good uh, very good research and and this sort of a stuff i think it lives on in in all the other file systems that you know ideas that you, you, we talk about but we don't see it that much in the um you know, own stuff right like um we, we still use AFS, but all the others, this could be used in, in one of these scavenging kind of stuff, and we don't look at those, right? So anyway, so let's... I wish I know how to stop this thing from forgetting all the settings you, you do about... Um, so anyway, so, so the, the ideas... So the other thing, you know, the, uh, one of the concerns that people had was the canonical it was not tested well kind of thing, right? And I, I feel for you, but such is like, I think I think it took them this, I think they claim from April to August to implement this, whatever they have, right? So that's like a year and a quarter kind of stuff, right? Um, for student projects, you don't get to do much more than that, right? So um, two years worth of coding to get one paper out, um, in the proper community, it's it's valued, right? Within the systems community, um, it's valued. In other communities, it should have been valued because your work is being studied like 15 years after you're done with it, and, and people are still reading about it. So that's that's a wonderful contribution. But in many places, it's not valued. So when when looking for a job, um, you know, people are looking at counts and stuff. You cannot say I had one paper which. 15 years down the road, people will be reading about it kind of thing, right? So testing, uh, whatever, right? But let's ignore the aspect of what they tested, but like, just look at whether we believe that, whether these things could have worked, right? So that mental exercise, they do that a little bit, and I think we can continue with that. Like, would it have been possible for them to do the sort of things that they wanted to do, right? They didn't go into all the issue of recovery and stuff, because frankly, I think recovery is one of those things where it's nice to talk about them, but to show that they work, you have to basically pull the plug on the disk to, sh I mean, so one of the things that you realize when you do research is, right, you want something which can, which, which you can draw a graph on, right? It's very annoying when you, when you have research where you say, we tried to pull the plug 10,000 times and all the times it worked, right? That doesn't sound like something you can do. So you want something like with the graph and say, Something like that, right? So recovery is one of those things where you have to inject faults at a certain point and then be able to repeat them and be able to kind of consistently say at fault rate of 10%, 20% kind of thing. I, I think we saw one paper, I forget what the paper was, which added, uh, injected faults and then had some, do you remember which paper it was? We read one paper, right? It was the, um, the Nooks. Hmm? No, the Nooks. Yeah, Nooks paper, right? So that those are fairly new, newer model where you kind of add the notion of adding, you know, injecting faults and um, being able to sort of quantify what happens. Otherwise, you can implement the all the recovery procedures, but then you have to sh test them, right? So you have to, you know, pull the plug at the appropriate point and then show the stuff. And um, if any of you try to do that, it, it's really, really bad, I mean, hard work because you know you have to test this thing for a while, so you, you don't tend to do that, right? So though we would like it, if they didn't do that. Let's let's forgive them because they are they are just students, right? Um, so they added the notion of RAID, right? So which of it is more important in this work? Do you think that LFS is more important? Do you think that RAID is more important? Or do you think the, the notion of clients doing this is important? Is the notion of RAID really important? They, they have RAID, right? I mean, RAID obviously gives you some reliability, right? Is that an important contribution, you think? Or is it is it secondary to that work? Uh, and, and and same for LFS, right? LFS gives them the option of collecting all the updates, right? So LFS basically allows them not just to stripe on the on the file level, but at the whole file system level. So each client collects all the uh, all the blocks that it has to write, and then sends them out to somewhere, right? So LFS allows them to write bigger fragments than if you had just striped across your own own file, right? Which technique do you think really helped their work? Which was sort of incidental? Um, and, and the notion of clients, right? The notion of clients doing this stuff, doing all the decision, rather than the server doing this decision, right? Not 
I personally don't think that the raid is all that important in that work, right? Any kind of raid that adds redundancy basically loses, you basically lose the entire point of this paper, which is to have the clients be in control of writing the data. And once you introduce raid with redundancy, then the clients lose uh, a little bit of their ability to figure out how to write data because things are being masked, which is not, which is not the point. What do you mean by things are being masked from them? Well, RAID on a server is basically like the file manager telling uh, telling the servers where to write the data or, or <laughs> deciding where to write the data, because the RAID is going to have is going to make optimizations based on the fact that you're writing this many files and we have this many disks and we have this redundancy pattern and we want to do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. um, which is basically what the file manager would do. The file manager would say, "Okay, I see that you want to write these files. Based on these files, I'm going to split it this way and this way." Mm -hmm. uh, so. It does allow for a faster disk, but I think it, it's it's not it's not it's outside the point, and it kind of removes from the point there. I'm not sure it'll give you a faster disk. Right? It'll probably slow you down. If you, but if you allow if you allow for striping and other things, it, it could look as they say, it could look like a faster disk if you write to two disks and read and have, have the bandwidth from both yeah. disks. Yeah. But but it. It just removes from the point. So how would, you, how would you attack that problem if you, I think you had it in your reviews, right? Yeah, I mean, it, LFS kind of does something like this, where they, if you want to make it, make the redundancy completely transparent overall, so mm -hmm. all of the servers, so it's basically like a rate overall servers. Or what you can do is you can do what they suggested, which is say, each disk gets its own server. And if you want to write to a specific disk, you have to connect to that server, um, which I think would be a better, better way of doing it. Uh, as long as you understood the difference between a logical server and a physical server. Uh, and so I'm kind of lost. So the client decides that, okay, if you assume that if the model they have, right? So you, you have a large uh, segment that is split into fragments, right? So when they do RAID, so let's, let's say they take a large segment, split it into three fragments, right? They have to compute the parity of these three, three fragments, and let's say create the fourth fragment, right? So now, now they have to find four storage servers to give the different fragments. So you may get the data, you may get data, you may get data, and somebody will get the parity, right? That's what they do, right? right but if, if, if you have a, one of those systems is a rated system already, mm -hmm. then it's doing extra work. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to having a RAID system on a, on a uh, storage server, it can just export all four of its disks, or all n of its disks. And then the client can choose which n of the disks to store. So um, at a higher level, so you're arguing that if the storage itself is running a RAID, so you get some amount of redundancy, right? So I don't have to worry about creating redundancy. I can use the redundancy on the storage itself. So I just send just three copies and let you manage your own redundancy, right? Which will solve some things, but not other things. I mean, if the server goes down, then you're completely gone, right? Um, and I think you also suggested another option, right, in your uh, write-up, right? It was on Monday, so I probably... So I think you said you can create n copies, right? Oh, so rather than yeah, saying yeah. three, you can create six copies, right? So you can put three and then three at, at some other some other blocks, I mean, some other nodes. So that way, um, I mean, I'm not doing anything, anything complicated parity, right? I just, I just have six copies. It's wasteful for storage, which wouldn't have been a good idea. I don't think it would have been a good idea back then because storage was, was a concern. But in the modern systems, that may be a way to go. Rather than doing this complicated, pseudo-complicated notion of a parity, just create six copies, right? And then, you know, store it in six different storage nodes. You increase the amount of storage, but you get the simplicity of um, not having to do anything, right? Why, do, why am I saying it's the simplicity of not doing the parity? What's the complication with the, having a parity? You have to ask every server what is data is at that spot, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can actually, so that means if you have n servers, you have to do n minus one queries to each server to get there. Is that what they'd have to do, you think? Yeah. Or can you sort of, can you use the parity bit that's already there to, in, in the one you're currently writing to figure it out? Yeah, so what, what do they do? So one of the one of the things he mentioned was, you know, in the pure RAID, if I want to add a, add to a block, right, I need to read all the old data and uh, the old parity, compute the new parity, and then write the new data and the new parity, right? 
do they have to do that? So when do they write, how, do they, how does the parity work here? How does the parity calculation work, right? So somehow, they, let's say there are three data blocks, and somehow they have to compute the parity of the three data blocks into a, uh, into a fourth block, right? What are the two conditions that they have to worry about for this parity calculation? I'll give a hint. The first one is if the, segment, the fragments are full, right? If you have four, three fragments which are full, they have to calculate the parity, right? The other case is the three fragments are half full and they have to write a parity, right? Which means that when the, the fragment gets full, they'll have to recompute the parity, right? So what do they do for the case when all the fragments are full? It's actually a trivial case, right? If you have all the fragments, then you know what the parity is, so you calculate the parity and you write it, right? The, 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 the complication comes when you have half a, half a block, right? But I don't think you have to read the uh, old blocks because their notion is all the stuff is on the local client, right? So the client should know what it's writing. So it should keep track of what it has written, right? So it has to anyway keep track of how much it's written because it doesn't have to go back. I mean, unless it's catastrophically, if you lose your disk, right? So if I only write, return half of the fragment, I should have saved the other half of the fragment locally. So when I add the new data, I can compute the, fra the, the parity locally without having to ask all the stuff from the server, right? Right? So with this, if this is how it works, what's the annoying thing that gets done according to me? What, what do you think I would find annoying about the parity, right? The hint is when you have to do partial right? partial fragments. What does RAID add to this equation that I don't think it's pure? So what are the characteristics of these fragments? What is the important characteristics of one of the fragments, right? I think, I think they talked about it's a large block of data with the identifier, right? The identifier is the client ID, uh, per client sequence number, and offset. That's up to the client. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? From the storage server perspective, a fragment is a large chunk of data with some ID to it, right? I don't have to worry about how the ID is created. All I have to do is store this, uh, maintain this storage, right? I don't have to worry about how the placement and all happens, and I, I can I get to decide whether it goes in cylinder groups or whether what what I do with it locally, right? But what's the other characteristic of a fragment that a storage server does? If you're a storage server builder, what is what can you do on a fragment? What are the operations on a fragment? This actually is common with the log structure file system too, right? So you have to be able to write the fragment, right? You have to be able to read the fragment. You have to be able to delete the fragment. What else do you have to do? Do you need to overwrite a fragment? Or append to a fragment? you can just assume that entire fragment will always be given to you. And mm -hmm. if the data at the end is missing, then the data at the end is missing. But uh, you always start from the beginning to write. So you don't necessarily need uh, to end operation because you can always read in the first part of the data and then tell it to write the first part of the data plus whatever you want to append to So you can either overwrite it or append to it, right? So if you only write partial fragment, then you can add to it, add to the end, or you may have to overwrite it, right? So you, you can simulate appends with overwrite by reading the partial fragments mm -hmm. and then concatenating whatever you want to append onto it mm -hmm. and then telling it to write that data. So you don't necessarily need append. It's not, I mean, it's nice mm -hmm. because it, it, it saves a read mm -hmm. and partial write, but it's not necessary. So in, in okay. So how, how do they do it here? What, so what does this, what does this story server, how do they do it? The 
important thing to note is the storage server only supports, does not support overwrite, right? There is no overwrite in any of the stuff, right? So if you modify a file, essentially, this is the same as log structure file system, right? So if you had a file which had a certain number of blocks, certain number of blocks, right? Let's say there are four blocks, right? So you figure out what fragment it fits in, and you say, okay, these four fragments are part of this file, right? Later, if in your application, if you modify this block or if you create a new new file, new co file contents, right? In the file system, all you're going to do is you're going to create a new fragment add the, let's say this is Y, so you create this Y, right? And you tell the file manager that the file now points to here, right? So these things are orphaned, but they're never overwritten, right? It's up to the cleaner to get rid of those. I mean, that's, that's one of the fundamental things about the log structure file system, right? You, you always write and read, you don't modify anything in place, right? So all the, all the things, so if you create, if you modify the file in application space, it creates two copies, and that's why you need a cleaner process, right? So from the storage perspective, for storing data, all it has to do is write once, right? So even if you wrote half that block, it can append to it, but it never overwrites what was there before, right? Whereas for parity, they allow you to overwrite, right? Parity has to be overwritten. Because the parity is computed on the whole data, right? The new parity would not be appended to the cannot be appended to the old one because of the way the, the calculations work. So you have to write the new one, right? So in their system, everything is right once except for the parity which can be overwritten, right? So that's one of the reasons I think it's kind of strange because adding the RAID means that you have to calculate the parity, which means that when you're doing the partial uh, partial writes, the data blocks are returned once, and the new data is just appended to where, whatever you had before. Except for the parity, you have to overwrite them, or you have to create a new parity, parity block every time you create the stuff, and you have to keep track of those, right? And that becomes uh, messy, because now then the client has to keep track of where the parity is for these stuff. Um, so what, what, is the, what is the problem with, let's say the parity, uh, if you had a half full parity, you create a new parity, right? You create a new copy of those, right? What would happen if you have to do that? See, with the, with the data, right, when I, when, you, when I had something half full, I, I'd say append to it, right? And I said with the parity, you cannot append to it, you have to overwrite. If I didn't, if the system does not support overwrite, I would have to create a new copy like, like you mentioned, right? and leave this orphan, right? Would that work for storing the fragments? How does the client write a file? How does the client write a fragment? It keeps, it keeps a segment, right? It keeps some sort of a segment here. And it's like a last structure file system, right? So you ask at the client, if you're operating on file one, you're modifying file one, and then let's say you're operating at two, one, two, one, like this, right? You collect enough stuff, right? And then you fragment them to the storage server and send it off to the storage server, right? What else do you do? You have to send uh, the, those deltas to the file manager to let it know that you've changed yeah so, yeah, yeah, so you have to do the deltas, and we'll get the deltas uh, a, a little bit. Um, what else do you do? What, is this, what does the file manager do? One of the assumptions that we had when we started the discussion was the file manager is a bottleneck, right? Because it, it, it's involved in some things, right? So what do, why is it a bottleneck? What does it do? It stores all the metadata for the files and also the index of which blocks are at which locations on the server. Yeah, so it, it keeps track of, for the file one, right? It has to keep track that the block is wherever, right? So the client has to say, I decided to store this fragment on storage server one, let's say this one, right? 
which means that on the file notion, it has to say, I put this in storage server one, this in SS one, right? It has to put it on this on the file manager, right? So the client has to decide, it has to fill this segment, fragment it, and then it has to figure out where the file that is storing are going, and then it has to add it and store it on the file manager, right? Right? So in this sense, the parity would have to be somewhere. So let's say this, this you know, the parity, it has to decide where the parity is. The parity has to be stored here too, right? It has to be stored on the file manager, right? If you were to do this model of when you have to update the parity, you create a new block, that means now you have to go back to the storage manager and say, this parity you had before is no longer valid. Whereas if you had to append to the data, it does not have to go back to the storage manager, right? So parity is kind of messy because Parity means that either you have to allow overwrite there on the storage, or the client has to go back to the meta, meta server manager every time and say, I appended to uh, existing uh, block. If I did, I have to give you a new fragment, new uh, parity bit, right? So their decision was they didn't want to go back to the same, you know, to file manager all the time. They basically said parity can be overwritten, right? So the, the storage manager, is simple, it only supports read, write, append, delete, and overwrite just to deal with parity, which is kind of uh, annoying, but that's, that's, uh, that's what they have to do, right? Um, so yeah, so the, the story manager has to keep track of all this stuff. So why does the story manager have to keep track of all these things? If the client knows where things are, what's the reason why the storage manager has to keep track of this stuff? of where the, where the file blocks are. Well, the client can't know where everything is. It can only know where the stuff is that it dealt with itself, or if it loaded up, if it cached up all, if it did, if it cached all that it, metadata, mm -hmm. it can only know what was true when it first did the caching. Mm -hmm. If another client changes something that it needs to be, then so if client A changes something, client B might eventually need to know about it. Yeah, especially when the client B wants to operate on the same file, right? right? If, if they all operate on this, you know, this joint set of files, you don't need the file server. But what you assume is, you know, client one operates on a file, but client two may also operate on the same file. So you have to create this, this metadata so that another client, if it wants to operate on the same file, it can pick it up, right? And that's where the cache consistency comes in, right? So if you don't have this, you don't have to do any cache consistency, in which case you can distribute it by basically having the clients keep track of all the files it's stored. You don't need to send anything to a server except for reliability. I mean, it, it, there's one more copy of it, but essentially that's what you avoid, right? So the consistency problem is if I operate on file one, and if, I, if another client operates on file one, right, at the same time, we may both be deciding on doing something, right? Read or write or whatever. The consistency problem comes in where we have to decide which of those two have to happen, right? If two of them are, have the same file open, you have to be able to say the user would see, you know, this user would, let's say, let's call number this, right? Let's say this is one, two, three, four, five, and this is six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? let's say these are modifying the stuff, right? You have to be able to quantify what a third person would see. If, you're, if you come and open the file, we have to know, would you see one, two, three, four, five, or do you see six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or would you see one, seven, three, what have you? Like, what is the interleaving of these two files, right? And that's part of the, the job of the file manager. It has to decide how these things operate. So if two people open the file, it invalidates something and creates some kind of consistency, right? So what is the consistency protocol that they use? What what kind of operations would you see in this kind of a scenario? They lock the file completely once somebody starts to edit it, right? You can't. They let, let, they, yeah, they let you go for, forward for some things, right? So, 
this is sort of the last section. And I, I'm not sure how many of you kind of plow through to the last section, right? Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, we'll we'll read a lot more of this in the few lectures afterwards because that's that's the fundamental key, right? If that didn't happen, if there's no sharing of the same file by multiple clients, this is sort of boring, right? Because you know you you read your own file, I read my own file, then there is no notion of <coughs> consistency. But if two people want to operate on the same thing, right? The challenge is I can keep it uh, simple by letting uh, uh, simple. So one option is to say only one person can write. So before I modify a file, I talk to the file manager and it can prevent you from doing anything on it. It prevent you from doing read or write on it, right? Why would you prevent it from doing read or write on it? Depending on what the other person is doing, right? So if the other person is also reading, then you, I can let you read. But if the other person wants to write, you have you can prevent you from reading, right? Or I can prevent I can let you read and write up to a certain point. And, and we'll see how NFS does that, how AFS does that um, in, in, in subsequent lectures. But that's essentially the complicated stuff. So I can I can be optimistic and let you read what you read because um, that's you know you, you, you get some version. Um, so we have to define specifically what you will get to read in more of a logical clock and logical notions of what the ordering of how things happen, right? And I don't think this, this paper exposes a, a, a specific set of guiding principles on how things should happen, right? The only thing I, I saw more specifically was when, they, when, they, um, when, the, the, when the file manager crashes, right? It orders things based on the order in which it got the deltas, and that's where the one of the things that the deltas too. So it can replay on the deltas. So it makes sure that whatever order you saw while the system was operating is the order that you will see when the system is recovering, right? What order you saw during the system operating is what you'll see, but not necessarily what that order was, right? So that's that's sort of like a um, little bit of open in this paper, and we'll we'll see more of that in the in the subsequent lecture. And that that that's the hard part, trying to figure out. So if, if I'm very consistent and I only let one person operate on the file, think you'll, you'll be fine, but you'll, you'll, if there's a lot of sharing, then the system will, will suffer, and you want things to kind of move along, and how you operate on that is, 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 the, is, is things that we'll look at in the subsequent lectures, right? So they, add, they have a lot of, lot of ideas. They have they are lot, lots of these, these things into the system. So we'll, we'll sort of look at what the uh, things are. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that RAID kind of pollutes the stuff, but it, it's, you know, it's still nice to have, right? Um, so the client notion is, you know, it creates stripes. Basically, you know, it, collect, it, it collects all the reads and writes to a file, and all the writes, it puts them into a log like LFS, right? And whatever data structure it has to create to maintain the inodes and all those things, it does within its own block. But it, it sends that metadata onto the file server, so some other clients can operate on the file. And then it, it directly gets to send all the data to the storage servers, right? So the, the data transfer goes from the client to the storage server and does not go through the metadata server. Metadata server only keeps track of where the different blocks are, and that's their job, right? So the st storage servers are, are fairly trivial because they get to store the fragments, and fragments are a large chunk of data and identifier. You want this to be large enough to make the numbers work, so you want to keep these things busy. And, and you, you tend to have this a large number, so you can you can actually amortize the cost of doing this stuff. And you don't have to worry about how these things are organized on that particular machine, so you're free to do. You can, you can implement this on top of a sprite file system or whatever file system you have on the local system, right? That's not the concern here. Um, it's a very simple concept because all you have is an identifier. So the, the storage server will have to keep track of where the identifier is and where the segment fragments were stored. So just so that when you do a retrieve, I know where to get the data from. But other than that, the storage server is trivial, right? It has to do a store a fragment, and it, it 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 should be done synchronously in their system. Where so when you send a fragment, it does not get back to you till the fragment is returned, right? Um, append to a fragment has to be atomic, right? Why does it have to be atomic? So one of the things that you they have to do to figure out if a segment is valid or if it's only half return is you have to have a checksum, right? They they, they have a notion of a checksum to make sure that the fragment is valid, right? Um, 
because you, the system may crash at any point, so it may be crashing halfway through, right? So if you don't do it atomically, you already had some data, right? Add some data with a checkpoint value to it. So if you add the new value and, and the new value didn't fully go through to disk, right? And you, so you, you, you couldn't, you don't have valid uh, um, checksum, then you also lose the data that was returned before, right? Which was given to you synchronously. So you, you want to make sure that it's atomic, meaning, you know, you, you write the new fragment and then you, uh, so I can, I can do a checksum on either the old one or the new one when it finishes, right? You should be able to retrieve a fragment, which is, I mean, which is the reason why the, why, why you store something. Um, you need to delete a fragment, which is not done by the application because application, like you said here, never updates anything, right? So, it, it, so you always send a new fragment. So the deletion happens at the, at the, at the stri stripe cleaner, which is job is to clean, right? Which is sort of the like same as what you did with the log cleaner in the log structure file system, right? So it has to keep track of the liveliness of the data. It has to keep track of which blocks are being used and which is not being used. At some point when all the blocks are not being used, it can f delete it, right? So it, its job is to delete it when things are done, either when there is nothing being used, or you can move some of the some of the objects into somewhere else. So if you find that all in all the X, X marked ones are deleted, right? So I can I can decide to you know move these two blocks which are good into some place else, and then delete the the segment, right? How would I do that? If I was a stripe cleaner and somehow I figure out that these things are not valid anymore, right? And these two are valid. So I copy these two into some other locations. And then I can delete this, right? Do I need to do something else? I'm as a stripe cleaner. Remember there's a pointer here saying this is part of a file, right? A client, some client put, you know, put some file in here. So the file metadata would, would point to those two blocks, right? So if I do as a stripe cleaner and if I change this stuff, I have to go back to the, the file manager, metadata manager and say, these two blocks are pointing to the old one. Now make them point to the new one, right? I have to do that because otherwise the, the application will come here, look at this block, and then it'll go over here and read whatever the block is and use the file, right? And there are a lot of interesting stuff which happens when you try to do that and we'll, we'll see. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 I don't know if I have it as a separate site, but essentially what happens is the Stripe Cleaner is running in the background. Its job is to keep track of all the changes which are happening and then do the appropriate thing, right? So now the, the client is creating files, it's creating files and it's modifying files and all those things. So it knows what was used and what is not used. The metadata manager keeps track of all this stuff and the Stripe manager has, the cleaner has to get that information, right? So you want these, the, 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 the cleaner may not, if it doesn't talk to anybody, it can sort of look at what the metadata manager has and then try to see if there's a mapping back from, so if, if you can see that if there's anybody pointing to this block, right? So it can look at all the metadata it has and see if any of those point to this particular block. If it is not, then it can delete those, right? That's one way to go about it. The way they took is to have create the notion of a delta, right? So every time you modify something, you create these tokens called deltas, which tell you what you did. So if the client was to, no longer use this and then you know have this new one, it says that I overwrote from this block to this block. So that delta tells somebody that this block is no longer used. And you have to send it to the, the, the cleaner. So the cleaner can look at that and go, okay, these blocks are not used. So it can keep track of what are, are valid, right? So it knows that when one, the, this file went away, these things went away. Another delta would show that when next file was deleted, this became free and so on and so forth. So everything that the client does, it does a RPC sort of communication to, I mean, it's communicating what it's doing to the Stripe cleaner to this delta, which I think is sort of like a poorly named because it's not, it's not a delta, I mean, it's actually a communication mechanism, right? Right? 
so it, it, the client is saying whatever it, it's doing to the, the cleaner through the delta, right? 